Good evening, I'm Jim Lara. On the News Hour tonight, the news of this Tuesday, and a News Hour Science Unit report on students with a passion for science, technology, and robots. And finally tonight, a high school robotics competition that is changing students' lives. News Hour correspondent Tom Bearden has our science unit report. It was the opening round of the semifinals at the Colorado Regional First Robotics Competition, a rough and tumble game where robots score points by firing rubber balls through a hoop. We disabled it, it's disabled. Suddenly, one robot stopped moving. What? Anymore. Do we have another key I mean, or anything I mean, else? Yeah, in there. The members of Team 159, Alpine Robotics from Poudre High School in Fort Collins, scrambled to fix their broken robot. The belt! It's the belt, Aaron! It's the belt this on this side. side. Officials warned the team that they had just a few minutes to make repairs or be replaced by another team. You're not gonna make it? Okay. Sorry, guys. They couldn't do it and were forced to leave the field. Team captain Nick Hobbs showed one of his coaches the problem. So we can't drive. The thousand dollar robot had been stopped cold when a key that cost about a nickel fell into the drivetrain. It was heartbreaking, but dealing with breakdowns like this is exactly what FIRST is all about. FIRST, an acronym meaning for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, was the brainchild of Dean Kamen, an inventor best known for developing the Segway scooter and the iBot wheelchair. The skills these kids learn when they participate in FIRST give them career opportunities. Do you want to be an electrical engineer, a physicist? Do you want to do proteomics or genomics or nanotechnology? What exciting career do you want to go into? We're helping you make that option possible. Kamen says helping kids develop a passion for math, science, and engineering is vital to the country's future. In this country, we have kids who think what they want to excel at is football or basketball. What they want to do with their time is the entertainment industry. And I think the balance is so distorted that it literally leaves our country at the risk of losing its position in leadership in technology and as a consequence of that we will lose our position of leadership in quality of life, standard of living, security, health care and all the other things that Americans somehow take for granted and we've got to change kids attitudes fast. It was back in January when this year's competition began with a kickoff rally in New Hampshire that was beamed by satellite to auditoriums all over the country. For the nearly 30,000 high school students who participate, this is their first glimpse of what game they will have to design their robots to play. This year's game is played on a 26 by 54 foot field. This year it was a complicated mix of shooting a ball through a high goal for three points into low goals for one point and climbing up a ramp at the end of the two and a half minute game to score bonus points. Just minutes after the kickoff rally ended, Team 159 huddled to plot their strategy. So here, here's, here's what I want to start doing now, is I want to start defining characteristics of our robot that we want to utilize. I think the camera... One of the great things about this competition is that they give you a problem and it's really vague and it's very real world and we end up working through it just like a, a staff of engineers at HP would, um, but we're in high school, which is a really great opportunity. Which, do we have three of them? Yes. Is that what we're supposed to have? Okay. Each of the 1,100 high school teams that compete in the competition received a kit containing many of the parts that must be used to build the robot. One of the things that the kit does is it keeps everything level, because otherwise you'd have people going out and buying the, the heaviest duty motors with the most efficient electrical output out there, and uh, they, their robot would obviously have more pushing power because of it, but not everyone can afford it. They've got all those plates cut. Even with the kits, competing isn't cheap. Entry fees for each level of competition cost about $5,000. Additional parts for the robot not in the kit can cost $1,000 more. The students are required to raise the money themselves by finding corporate sponsors and through fundraisers. Team 159 was lucky to have a well-equipped machine shop in their school so they could make most of the parts themselves. Many schools have to pay to have that done. 
What I suggest is that you know you come up with the design and, and prototype it as soon as you can. Yeah. See how, Each team how has how adult mentors, really teachers, parents, and professional goals. engineers who spend hundreds of hours guiding the students as they build the robots. Andres Teen is an engineer with LSI Logic, a high-tech firm based in Fort Collins. Our goal, you know, from a, a team perspective, is to always to have the kids drive the design process because that's the way that they're going to learn. A um, few of the kids have some pretty strong minds and some opinions, and we probably will have some concerns on some of the things that they implement, but that's, you know, they have to go through that process. After the initial kickoff, each team has just six weeks to design, build, program, and test their robot. <laughs> Most teams also build a mock-up of the playing field so they can practice playing the game. It means a lot of late nights, a lot of delivery pizza, a lot of stress. Sean, quiet! And sometimes very short tempers. Try to focus on what's getting done and everybody's distracting you. Stupid questions like that. <laughs> the team had a lot of trouble getting their shooting mechanism to throw the rubber balls the 30 feet necessary to score high goals. Kind of have a lot of weight on my shoulders is the letting the team down if it doesn't all work because a lot of the mechanisms are my design so I should have made sure they all worked ahead of time and that kind of thing. And there were some basic machine shop problems. Hobbs described a particular low point as they were drilling holes into the robot's base plate. On one side our holes weren't the right dimensions and we couldn't figure out why and then we realized that the table had been tilted. By this time it was like 4.30 in the morning and we realized that everything we'd done that night was, was pretty much for naught because this table was, was off by two hundredths of an inch. In February, with only one week to go before the deadline, the programmers still had no robot to work with. It's definitely getting a little bit stressful, especially since I'm learning how to program and um, the programming comes into effect once you have a robot. So like all of the stuff we've written so far, you can't be tested until we have the actual robot. Let's hear it for Team 159. Somehow, Team 159 met the six-week deadline. And on April 1st, we're in battle at the Colorado Regional Competition. 20 seconds left. Looks like Alpine Robotics playing some good defense there, trying to get in the way of that blue goal. The competitions are deliberately designed to have the feel of a sports match, complete with play-by-play -play announcers and cheering fans. The whole idea is to make science appealing to young people. Science and engineering and inventing and creating is a gas. It's tremendously exhilarating. It's lots of fun. The games require a lot of teamwork. Each match has three robot teams competing against three other teams. Team 159's robot was performing fairly well until that five cent part failed. The kids were obviously disappointed, but not for long. The 2006 Colorado Regional Chairman's Award winner is Team 159, Alpine Robotics. In the end, their team won the most prestigious regional prize of all, the Chairman's Award, given to the team that has done the most to encourage other students to pursue science and technology. Team 159 had done that by helping other schools start robotics programs of their own. It meant they could go to the national competition a month later in Atlanta. Welcome to the Georgia Dome. The Nationals bring 340 teams from all over the world together for two raucous, strenuous days of head-to-head -head competition. Each team has its own unique story to tell. Is that battery? Team 812 came from the Preuss School in San Diego. It's a charter school made up of inner-city minority students whose parents never attended college. The team won the Chairman's Award from the Southern California region for helping tutor kids who otherwise might never get one-on-one -on -one attention in math and science. Rob Maneri is the team's coach. These kids every year do somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000 hours of community outreach, to, whether it's tutoring at the Boys and Girls Clubs, or last year we had some students work at a home for battered women and their children, and this working on getting technology uh, understood by other people. He says the program has literally changed the lives of his kids. Kids like Vu Hong, who has a scholarship to MIT next year. It showed me that I could have a lot of potential in college, and I would have never aimed as high as MIT before. But now, first they showed me anything can happen. Angelina Saldivar got a scholarship to Amherst College. I really didn't think 
that I could do anything like this, engineering. I, I'm a Hispanic female. And doing engineering or even going to college was something that was completely out of the question for me. And really being through the program, it taught me to believe in being able to achieve anything. Team A12 had very little money. Instead of staying in a hotel in Atlanta, as most teams did, they crashed on the floor of a friend of their coach. But that didn't dampen their fun or their success. Team 812 finished an impressive 18th out of 88 teams in their division, and Maneri was named the top mentor in the country. All right, get back, get back, get back, get back! Team 159 also had quite a bit of success. Their robot performed well, and again they made the semifinals. All right, we're good, we're on. We're good, we're on. Until another, different part failed in the heat of battle. One of our drive belts is dead. Get everything ready to change it out. Go, go, go. They were hoping their partners would call a timeout so they could fix it and continue playing. We gotta go right now. Yes. Don't tell me yes if you're not gonna move. You're gonna move? You sure? Ultimately, 159's two partners decided to get a replacement team. I'm very sorry. We wanted you guys on the field, but we had to go with the backup. 159 was out. Well, guys, thanks for the frantic effort. But Hobbs said he finished the season very proud of what they'd all accomplished. I think that's one of the reasons that robotics is different than sports. Like, at the end of a soccer game, if you lose, you never feel good. Like, it's never like, wow, I learned something useful today. Like, it's always like, man, we lost. But, like, at the end of the season, like, you, you think about it, and you, you, you look at the robot, and you realize that, that we spent over, like, 40 hours a week, each of us, are working on it. And so the amount of time we spent competing, like, opposed to the amount of time we spent building is, is minuscule. Unbelievable! There's one other way that first is different from sports, and it was on display in the final game of the 2006 competition. This 296 machine, its shooter was inoperable because they had lost a master link on a chain on the 296 machine. No one on this alliance had a master link to get that shooter working again. It was this alliance that had the master link, gave it to them to get this working right here. Three, two, one, go. The final match proceeded. This is anybody's match! And the team that got the help ended up beating the team that assisted them. We have a winner! It was the perfect example of what Dean Kamen wants the competition to be. At first, it's not about who wins, it's how you play the game.